Good. And then I can put the computer here. And do we have some power? Yeah, yeah, but uh, then I can also plug in the power case. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have it. A very good morning to all of you, all of you present here, respected dignitaries, eminent speakers, delegates, students. Am I audible? Am I audible now? Okay, cool. A very warm welcome from, uh, on behalf of the organizing committee uh, from the Department of Biochemistry at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhopal. Uh, for our three-day hands-on workshop come seminar on molecular diagnostics, a step towards capacity building in rapid disease identification and prognosis. We cordially welcome all our eminent speakers who've traveled from far distances despite uh, their busy schedules. We apologize uh, for the delay that has uh, happened. The Department of uh, we also are grateful uh, of for the uh, live telecast uh, to 300 medical colleges which have been sent across. There is some echo, I believe. Uh, this webcast has been possible uh, with the support of NMCN, Network National Resource Center Telemedicine at SGPGI Lucknow. We are also grateful to the Telemedicine Center uh, at Ames Bhopal uh, with Dr. Ajay Haldar who has made this possible. Before we begin with felicitating our uh, dignitaries, I would like to take this opportunity to tell a little bit about uh, the Department of Biochemistry this at Ames Bhopal. has been possible uh, the department was established uh, in 2012 and since then has shown demonstrable uh, progress in teaching, patient care uh, and research as well as human resource development. The department strength as you can see here is close to 40 with uh, six faculty and research associates, senior residents, tutor demonstrators, technical assistants and so on and so forth. We are privileged and proud that we provide services for 80 biochemistry tests, routine and specialized tests for the OPD and IPD patients since last five years. Our major goal is not only uh, with teaching patient care but also with research. We have been developing uh, the infrastructure associated with our department which includes semi-auto analyzers, auto analyzers as well as uh, for various tests using the Siemens Advia Centaur hormone analyzer and so on. Our research interests include uh, toxicology, genetic susceptibility to cancer, cancer informatics, oncovirus detection, cancer biomarker development and nanotechnology as well as tissue engineering, a goal towards uh, developing personalized treatment. At present, we have all the basic tools for molecular diagnostics, and we are in the process of establishing stem cell facility as well as a BSL-2 facility. Faculty of the department have secured prestigious extramural grants amounting to more than two crores from various uh, granting funding agencies and we have collaborations from within and outside Ames Bhopal and MP. We have been addressing research questions pertaining uh, to human health in basic and applied sciences. Our department has played a pivotal role in establishing the Regional Virology Center at Ames Bhopal. Additionally, we wish to emphasize that the department has trained manpower like postdoctoral fellows, junior research fellows, MSc and MD dissertations. The MBBS students have been also awarded the prestigious STS ICMR fellowships and other fellowships from IIT Kharagpur. The faculty has been invited to deliver lectures in various conferences and have mentored, uh, have published in high impact journal and have mentored uh, in various personnels and training programs. 
uh, we also have uh, been wanting to do this capacity building for a while so that we enter the era of molecular diagnostics and uh, look forward to uh, not only building the infrastructure but also collaborations within and outside Ames Bhopal. The department is headed under the leadership of Professor Sudhir Kumar Goel who is the head of the department and also Dean Students Welfare. With these few words, uh, we would want to now invite uh, the dignitaries uh, on the stage one by one for the floral welcome. We would like um, we would like to honor uh, our uh, chief guest, Professor Ruta Mulherkar, former head of Genetic Engineering Lab from the Advanced Center for Treatment, Research, and Education in Cancer, ACTREC. Uh, Navi Mumbai to receive a floral welcome. Thank you, Madam, uh, for your constant support and being with us despite your busy schedule. May I please request uh, Professor Thomas Breeze, Associate Director, Center for Infection and Immunity at Columbia University, New York, to receive a floral welcome. We are grateful to you, sir, for having traveled across the oceans to be with us in the Lake City, Bhopal. May I please request Professor T. N. Dhol, Head of the Department of Microbiology, Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute, Lucknow, to receive a floral welcome. Thank you very much, sir, for your constant guidance for this workshop. We are indebted. We also have our uh, dear faculties who are here. We would also like to invite Professor Neil Kamal Kapoor, Dean Research and Head of Pathology Unit to be uh, there for the floral welcome, madam. Yes, and she's also a part of the executive committee of uh, We would also request a floral welcome to the chairperson of the workshop and also uh, head of the department uh, of biochemistry, Professor S.K. Goel, to please uh, be on the stage for the same. Please, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, uh, I'll have to request uh, the chairperson, Professor S.K. Goel, to kindly deliver uh, the welcome address to the August gathering. So, please. The very good morning to you all, and thank you very much, Ashwin, for very, you know, brief and precise details of the Department of Biochemistry. Because one thing at the very beginning, I would like to tell that this institution, that is in Bhopal, along with other new institutions, are the brainchild of our ex Prime Minister, Sri Atal Bihari Bajpayee ji, who visited. Uh, Ames Delhi in 2003 and somehow he felt that the whole country needs these kind of institutions. So I really salute to that super thought to our ex-Prime Minister and Bhat Rana Shri Atal Bihari Bajpayee ji that he could dream of this thing and today we are standing here and trying to you know serve the society and that is a kind of commitment you know when I joined here it was all very beginning and we thought that we have to work hard and with that dedication with that commitment to serve our students our patients and nurture our young faculty we are here all the senior persons are trying their level best and which includes our four deans uh, dean academics dr rajesh malik our dean research dr neil kamal kapoor dr uh, Ex dean exam, Dr. Ragni Mehotra, and myself as Dean of Student Welfare, and our earlier dean, 
who really catered the need of all the students and everybody single-handedly, Dr. Bala Krishnan. I am really telling you, we need to say that with their leadership, we could really come to some level. And keeping those things in mind and the de dedication and continuous effort to bring the things in order in a new institution like Ains Bhopal and other institutions, we are committed to the cause and we are trying to modernize, trying to add up everything. And as already told by Ashwin, we are doing it slowly and in a very steady phase. And our sense of commitment as a team, because I will say only one word, that single person cannot do anything. It is the dedicated team and the leadership to nurture that team is the most important thing in the life. And with that, this diagnostic workshop was planned, we discussed, and I have no hesitation in admitting that this was the brainchild of one of my colleagues, Dr. Rashmi, who said that, sir, we need to do it. And then we could th think of many of the persons, and the one of the most appropriate person was Dr. Thomas Breeze. We thought that if he agrees, we can really make a good beginning. So I really thank uh, Professor uh, Thomas Breeze for accepting the offer. It was not easy for him again. I would like to address this thing because we had seen the situation at Delhi, which was really scary. And many of the flights were canceled the way I think he was in touch with us and the airline, Delta Airline. They canceled their initial few flights, few, few flights, so we were really scared whether we can really do this thing or not. But because of the constant touch of Rashmi and Dr. Thomas, we could make it. I am really thankful to you, sir, that you also were very vigilant at every moment not to miss the flight or not to leave the chance. So really wonderful. I am really thankful to you, sir, very much. And with this, I would like to talk about the particular event which we are doing it. So on my behalf, on our Department of Biochemistry and on AIM's behalf, I welcome you all to this beginning, which we are thinking will go a long way because our motive is not to just train our young uh, you know, faculty members and all at Madhya Pradesh, but to support them for the cause to develop the things at their place and whenever they are failing or feeling any problem in you know continuing the things they can approach us department of biochemistry will you know offer all the possible facilities everything so that they can really cater our uh, the really need to do the things and start it because starting and then continuing is a very important thing in our country <clears throat> so now as we all know that advancement in molecule tools results in rapid analysis of the biological markers associated with the oncology, genetic diseases, as well as infectious diseases, and is an important tool for disease diagnosis, monitoring, as well as risk assessment in individuals. As a result, molecular diagnostics-based identification of biological markers would result in drift from one drug fits all to personalized treatment, because that is a very important thing right now, you know, personalized treatment, and eventually lead to improved patient output. In this regard, the three-day event organized by our department would provide hands-on training to biomedical clinicians and students, promoting them to develop such tools at their institutes. As I already told that we will be having a keynote address by uh, very eminent speakers, uh, Dr. Thomas Breeze, who is the Associate Director, CII, Columbia University, USA, Professor Ruta Murayelkar. She is the, um, our chief guest also, and has already you know, shown her leaderships by being as the part of the Advanced Center for the Treatment, Research, and Education in Cancer, Navi Mumbai. I would like to tell one more point that one of our student, uh, faculty, Dr. Uh, uh, Kutnis, uh, is the student of Dr. Ruta, and that's something we are very fortunate to have him. And then we have Professor T. N. Dhol, 
who is again one of the finest microbiologist and serving the aims sorry serving the sgpgi for a very long time and i am a good friend of him from last i think 20 25 years and we are fortunate to have another student that is dr rashmi choudhury his real sincere effort in that direction we see the quality of all our students and we have another faculty dr ashok who has been trained by one of the sgpgi professor uh, what was the name of your professor dr godbole you know so you know i am very happy that we got one of the finest team we have two more new faculties who are one is trained with professor basudevan and one more from Nag nagpur dr sukesh mukherjee and dr lokhande and because of all the you know wonderful team we have we have invited the young you know talent from germany who are indians and they wanted to come to india we got two fellows one for as a ramalinga soy fellow dr rohit saluja and one dr neha arya as inspired fellow so we are really feeling that a kind of team which we are making so that all these person can make a difference to build up this you know department which is very good last but not the least i request all the you know young persons that you should uh, not give up at any point of time again i'm repeating this thing because the purpose of this whole workshop is that please make sure that you should go back after having this hands on training and try to deliver which is very important this word deliver it reminds me of one very interesting instance happened about a uh, year and a half or about two years back the, when we were in the process of setting up this h1n1 facility at aims bhopal so one of my faculty uh, wanted to go to niv for that we have to go to the whole process of getting the approval from the dg icmr and all i did not lose the opportunity to catch professor katoj who was in bhopal so i came to know that he has come to nere i went to meet him waited for one and a half hour then we had a meeting we talked about it we got the approval right away then we discussed about the you know other facilities like one at gwalior and one at jabalpur i said why don't you give us to in bhopal also he said when we have this this money what you will do i only said one thing sir we will deliver you won't believe for me it was a surprise that professor katoj was really surprised about it that i have never heard a single word saying that to the point that we will deliver and with that with the effort of our microbiology department professor devashish our founder director dr uh, sandeep kumar and you know with the support of many of this we could really get a grant from icmr for the regional virology center at aims bhopal and it amount about 15 crores you know with that we are developing bsl2 and bsl3 facility so this is you know all a chain event things are happening and our positivity is giving a lot to that and that's something i would like to tell and think in terms of i am telling again things in terms of uh, capacity so to support others the most important thing is to support others and which will create a real positive environment in the system and the whole team will excel with these words i i want to know what is the next we can i i just say once one once again welcome to aims bhopal welcome to you know department of biochemistry and we are here to give whatever best possible we can give thank you very much thank you very much sir uh, for your vision and uh, the plan that you wish uh, to have this training and this capacity building workshop uh, at aims bhopal uh, we are fortunate that our uh, more guests and invited uh, uh, speakers are uh, arriving uh, we would uh, like uh, to uh, felicitate uh, professor ragini mehrotra dean examinations and uh, head of obstetrics and gynecology madam thank you very much for coming
we also welcome uh, commandant uh, pk mishra our financial advisor sir has been very supportive of the entire event without which you know getting all the uh, approvals and finances is where it is all facilitated we also uh, we also welcome uh, dr himanshu kumar uh, from uh, iser bhopal dr himanshu is an immunologist and we really welcome you sir dr himanshu please Uh, we would like to uh, welcome our two esteemed guests. One is Dr. Tiwari from NIRE. He is the director there. And Dr. Anil Prakash. He is the senior most scientist over there. And one more distinguished faculty from uh, HSDL, Dr. Richa Sood. And Dr. Ashwin, please one to Dr. Ashwin. Thank you very much. I would like to further emphasize that Dr. Richard Sood and Dr. Ashwin have played a pivotal role uh, in the Animal House facility, uh, which has been uh, developed uh, with Dr. Ashok Kumar here, and uh, they have been in the committees, and uh, also all of you sirs uh, for the various projects uh, that we are uh, collaborating on. So thank you so much for gracing uh, the occasion. Uh, no uh, conference uh, and workshop of this kind would be complete uh, without uh, Saraswati Vandana and lighting the lamp, uh, for which uh, uh, I may want to request all the dignitaries to be on stage uh, so that uh, we can uh, light the lamp uh, and take blessings uh, of the goddess Saraswati. Uh, and uh, we have our very talented uh, uh, nursing students uh, and MBBS students who would uh, recite uh, the Vandana for us. These are uh, first-year students, and I'm very happy uh, that they're all here. Uh, and we have uh, any pele uh, lamp light hoga, but they'll all be there. Yes, Dr. Rashmi. के फूल हम वो चमन है आपका 
जिस चमन के फूल हम वो चमन है आपका जिस चमन के फूल हम वो चमन है आपका स्वागतम है आपका आगमन है आपका स्वर की देवी ने दिया ज्योति का हमें दिया स्वर की देवी ने दिया ज्योति का हमें दिया ये जमी है आपकी आसमा है आपका ये जमी है आपकी आसमा है आपका स्वागतम है आपका आगमन है आपका स्वागतम है आपका आगमन है आपका Thank you so much, students. Uh, you are wonderful as always. Our students are uh, really wonderful uh, nursing and MBBS who have performed in various uh, festivals, uh, student festivals uh, across India and have uh, won laurels. They've got YouTube videos as well on the various uh, performances, including singing. With that uh, wonderful welcome, uh, I would invite uh, the organizing secretary, Dr. Rashmi Chaudhary, uh, to invite all the dignitaries for the release uh, of the uh, souvenir uh, for the uh, workshop. Yeah, please. Uh, hello and good morning to everyone. Uh, today is a very uh, special day for me, uh, not as an organizing secretary for this event, but to have my two mentors with me. Uh, one has given me a, a wings to fly, and second one, Dr. Thomas, has given me a platform so where we can perform. So today I... Uh, Department of Biochemistry uh, has uh, 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 made some uh, souvenirs for this event, so for the participants, and I request all our dignitaries to come on the stage to release the uh, souvenir. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, we really look forward uh, for the further uh, function. We have more guests uh, who have been arriving, and uh, we wish to felicitate and welcome all of them. Uh, we wish to welcome uh, Dr. Kushali uh, from Manet uh, with a floral uh, welcome. Uh, Madam is uh, a bioinformatician and has been uh, very uh, helpful for the bioinformatics module that has been a part of this workshop. Thank you, Madam, for coming. Uh, we also welcome uh, oh, sorry. 
I would like to extend my thanks to Dr. Rashmi. She has invited me to have a, a interaction with uh, you learned people, and I hope that this workshop is going to be very useful for the society. Thank you so much. Uh, we also welcome uh, Professor Amala Goswami, uh, Principal Nursing. Uh, Madam, please, uh, for being supportive uh, to have all your students in various roles uh, for this workshop. Thank you, Madam. And also Dr. Mamta Varma, uh, a faculty in um, uh, nursing department. We also welcome uh, Mr. Santosh Sohagura. Uh, sir is uh, Deputy Director Administration. Actually, it is all the approvals again that are most important for us for a successful conference. Thank you so much for all the support. Shall we begin? Okay, with all the welcome and uh, the cheer that is spread, uh, we now would want to begin uh, with the most uh, uh, awaited lecture uh, and the talk that we are looking forward to uh, by uh, Professor Thomas Breeze. While uh, Professor Thomas Breeze is arranging his, uh, you, okay, uh, I would like to. Uh, introduce a bit uh, about him. Uh, he has an extremely long CV to be talked about, uh, but I'll be very brief. Uh, Dr. Thomas Brees uh, is a global leader in infectious diseases surveillance and pathogen discovery for over 25 years. In subsequent years, Dr. Brees pioneered state-of-art methods in molecular biology to study the involvement of infectious agents in chronic and neuropsychiatric diseases as well as acute diseases. Dr. Breeze was one of the few foreign researchers invited by the Chinese Ministry of Science and Technology to investigate and respond to SARS coronavirus epidemic. Similarly, he was the first researcher to provide robust evidence that the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, coronavirus was likely transmitted to humans from camels in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Most recently, Dr. Breeze developed a groundbreaking diagnostic platform capable of detecting all viruses in a sample with great accuracy and sensitivity and at a minimal cost, which is important. Dr. Breeze's other activities include a service as an advisor to the WHO during the SARS and MERS epidemic, participation in the environmental determinants of diabetes in the Young uh, Steering Committee called as the Teddy Committee, uh, membership in the Borna Viride Study Group and Chair of the Bunya Viride Study Group in the International Committee on Taxonomy and Viruses. As we've been interacting with him for over two days and also with Dr. Rashmi, I understand that he is a mentor par excellence and takes special pride in his wards and students for them to excel. I welcome Professor Breeze. Thank you so much. Hello, can you hear? Oh, here yeah, maybe. Welcome. No, very far open. Well, welcome. And thanks a lot for the great introduction. And also, I'd like to thank sincerely all the organizers. I'm honored to be here. It's a great pleasure. It's very exciting. And I had a great welcome yesterday already by Dr. Goel and my dear friend Rajmi. And so thank you again for the invitation, the opportunity to be here and to present to you some of our work. Um, as you heard, I'm at the Center of Infection and Immunity at Columbia University, New York. And as you can imagine, the center has quite a range of um, work that is going on. So we do from basic uh, research projects, um, pathogenesis, host um, 
pathogen interactions, uh, microbiome studies, um, to, you know, um, chronic as well as acute disease um, research projects, and uh, there is a large variety of projects and work going on. What I want to do today is to focus in context of the title of that meeting on molecular diagnostics and want to explicitly talk about areas where we went from single pathogen detection, single plex assays, to more broad multiplex approaches to detect agents, communities of agents, studying interaction between pathogens. You might have more than one agent present and also to find agents that you might be aware of but not in the condition or in the context they appear, which is also an area that uh, becomes more and more interesting and important. The other is uh, acceleration of the SS rapid detection. The sooner you get a result, the more likelihood do you have to um, interfere or treat the disease. Uh, activities to spread the information, the data rapidly, either locally, uh, nationally, internationally, so there are opportunities. with this work, um, it was basically not a hypothesis-driven research, but it was what was called by many of the funding agency fishing expeditions. Yes, but that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to fish. The only way to catch fish is to go out fishing. That um, was in the beginning. We, um, Dr. Ian Lipkin, uh, we worked together 25 years, started out in California. He is now director of our center in New York. And at the time we were studying, as you heard in the CV description already, an um, agent that causes Borna disease. It's an animal disease primarily, but it has features that resemble neuropsychiatric disorders. And so there was an early hypothesis that an agent or sim this agent or a similar agent might be involved in uh, human syndromes but the agent was not characterized, there was no standardized diagnostics, there was basically nothing available. So we then characterized the agent molecularly. It was an paramyxovirus with a classical gene organization and um, with that knowledge one could then build PCR assays, ELISA assays with recombinant protein, get diagnostic approaches to the agent. So that basically started then a larger program where we wanted to use modern technology, microarrays, PCR, to um, improve detection and diagnosis of agents, make it more sensitive, more rapid, more efficient. Um, early on at that point in the mid-90s, late-90s, um, it was also the idea to use bioinformatic tools, databases that we are starting to build to uh, gather information and drive these molecular detection assays. And based on that early program, then uh, over the past 20 years, let's say, um, defined assays for molecular detection. What's the benefit of that? Molecular detection is usually fast, faster than culture or many of the classical approaches. In many cases more sensitive. It is quite economic. You don't need, need um, that much um, skill of the worker or infrastructure. And what's also important, you don't have to handle infectious material. So the samples usually can inact be inactivated at the source. You drive draw the sample in some inactivating buffer, then you can ship them, handle them, and treat them without major precautions. 
The drawback is if you look in the literature and recent um, submissions to GeneBank, let's say, uh, many of the information exists only as metadata. There is no biology. We start to lose the biology. If you want to do a test a drug or a vaccine, there is no isolate necessarily available. So that's something one has, has to watch because of the economic benefits, what we see in many of the Department of Health in the States or also in Europe is that the capacity for real biology is va uh, vanishing and everything is focusing, focusing on the molecular assays. That's a very single-sided view and uh, it also is dangerous. Serology is another area that is um, neglected. If you think about assays that are available, they are basically 20th century and not multiplex or in any way compatible to what we can do with molecular tools. And so the question is, can we build better assays for serology? And lastly, I already mentioned that bioinformatics that has to improve and um, per, um, optimized for those um, projects and the work. And with that, the task is still investigate acute disease outbreaks, investigate the uh, relationship of pathogens to chronic disease processes, characterize the microflora and health, as I mentioned, what is normal background and when does it become pathogenic, and do surveillance also in animals, keywords one health or zoonotic diseases, and then try also to build field systems then you, that you can go to the source where things happen. Now, I want to take you back almost 20 years. In 1999, we had the first opportunity to really um, put these essays and some of the concepts to work. It was the year when we had that outbreak of West Nile virus, a flavivirus disease. In New York City, cases of human and animal disease starting to pop up in the city area. Early on, it was suspected to be um, an American flavivirus, St. Louis encephalitis virus. There was some serologic evidence for that, but the uh, identity of the agent couldn't be verified by any other assays. What was going on was an outbreak, as I mentioned, in animals, horses, and also birds, here predominantly in the Bronx Zoo, um, um, where bird, exotic sp uh, bird species became affected. And um, the other was the human outbreak that um, evolved over several months. And as mentioned, there was serology evidence for SLE, St. Louis encephalitis, but no molecular proof or other confirmation of that finding. And so we got samples at some point to use some of the molecular PCR tests. At that point, we were using a domain-specific differential display assay to investigate these cases. In parallel, the animal um, disease was investigated and USDA Ames, Iowa was uh, even uh, capable to do or obtain a culture isolate, which was forwarded to CDC for analysis. But CDC clearly responded, we are concerned with a major human outbreak. Thank you for the animals uh, samples, but they have to wait until we have time and capacity to analyze them. So with the differential display assay, we use highly degenerate primers that are based um, on multiple sequence alignments. So here all the flavivirus genomes are aligned. And so you can identify the most conserved regions, oops, regions in those um, genomes. And for those, we can then define primers and make them fit to all the sequences in the alignment. And by that, get a broad range detection. So what happened is quite obvious. Um, we did apply the assay and identified a flavivirus, but not St. Louis encephalitis virus, but a virus that was known only from Africa, West Nile virus. The problem here also is we target regions that are not necessarily in existing uh, diagnostic tests used, because the diagnostics are usually based on serology 
characterization, serologic characterization of the agents. And these regions are highly variable. And so we were detecting areas that are underrepresented in knowledge and databases. So here only one, two agents were available for comparison. And if you look later on when we had the full, um, the full genome sequence, we could look also in the uh, surface protein region, and there's way more information available. And uh, then it turned out that um, it was related to an Israeli strain or isolate of West Nile virus. There are several lineages of the West Nile viruses. And so you could really uh, speciate and uh, identify and find detail um, the um, relationship and background of that virus. Anyway, with uh, that identification, we also built again PCR assays, real-time assays in that case, and could detect um, the virus in blood and serum samples, which um, was um, surprising in some way, because you also have to keep in mind that viral infections follow certain patterns and are usually quite different or uh, variable in the order with which viremia, um, clinical symptoms, and antibody responses are staged and happen. And flaviviruses are a bit, uh, pretty well known for an early viremia, and at the time when you usually have severe symptoms and see the doctor, the viremia is mostly gone, and the antibody response is um, in place. So the classical test for West Nile virus is serology. So many of the diagnosti diagnosticians said, well, it's a nice academic exercise to build in PCR, I see, but it doesn't have great relevance for practical diagnosis. Until in 2002, um, cases of uh, transmission of the virus by organ transplants or blood products were characterized. And um, that then triggered uh, the release of PCR assays for blood product screening, and in 2003, the first mandatory blood donor screening pro uh, processes were initiated in the United States nationwide. So that then um, justified the molecular approach and was one of the first applications of um, our methods. Now, West Nile virus is not truly a new virus. It was known, it was characterized, it was circulated in Africa and Europe, but it was new to the United States or the Western Hemisphere. Shortly thereafter, a true new virus appeared. That was one of the unfortunate advertisement campaigns in Hong Kong to the time. It reads, Hong Kong will take your breath away. It sure did, yes. Um, so, if you recall, SARS coronavirus um, was um, circulated in 2003, and here the characterization of the virus happened through various channels, mostly because the virus grew rapidly and well in culture, and Malik Paris was the first to obtain those cultures, and then many ways led to the characterization of SARS coronavirus, even consensus PCR um, reactions that were geared to other agents, but because of the high concentration and some cross-reactivity, you still got results. But mainly, the agent was characterized by classical virological approaches. Um, as you heard, we then were invited, Ian and me, to Beijing at the height of the outbreak to assist uh, the um, Ministry of Science and Technology who invited us, not the Ministry of Health, um, to assist them in building detection and assay capacity. Again, at that point in time, it was uh, PCR assays. And just to mention that here, usually we select by bioinformatic tools the most conserved regions or uh, biologically relevant regions where we put um, the primers and the PCR. Uh, in that case, for coronaviruses, you might know coronavirus has a particular replication or trans 
translation uh, strategy. So they um, synthesize mRNA transcripts along the whole genome in a nested fashion. So basically the end of the genome is included in all the transcripts, whereas the beginning is only in one or two. So the highest sensitivity, oops, the highest sensitivity um, you achieve here, that's the most target. So we placed our uh, primers in the nucleocapsid in the uh, three prime region of the genome. And um, then we generate standards that you can quantitate your reaction that are available also for QC quality control purposes. Um, introduce in those standards artificial signatures so that they can be distinguished, products can be distinguished from authentic, authentical PCR amplification products uh, to prevent contamination issues and then um, build um, spiked controls that can be used with all uh, assay and reactions. So with that um, we then built an assay for SARS and also for the other human coronaviruses, so in that case a four plate, three-plex assay, real-time PCR assay for detection. And with that um, we then in collaboration with Jung Hui Sai um, built um, assays and could show that PCR is highly sensitive and effective in early detection of SARS prior to immune responses and that particularly in non-invasive samples, in that case stool samples and feces that played a certain role in that outbreak. Now SARS, as you might recall, was first um, suspected to originate from mongoose as the natural uh, vector or uh, reservoir of the virus, then civets were blamed and basically uh, eradicated or at least heavily hunted. But finally it turned out that it's probably uh, bats that are the real reservoir for SARS coronavirus. And so not us uh, alone but also other groups started to do surveillance programs in rats uh, in bats. And this is a project that we performed in collaboration with EcoHealth, um, John Epstein here. Um, where we investigated the large flying foxes in Bangladesh for viral infection or presence of viruses and found in those uh, bats, in those bats in GB-like virus, in hepatitis related uh, virus in those bats. Now you have to know that these bats are the reservoir also for Nipah virus, a serious human uh, hemorrhagic fever disease and um, the virus is usually transmitted through feces or saliva of the bat that gets into palm sap collection pots. The people don't collect, they collect palm sap in uh, pots on the trees. And at night the um, bats can contaminate and so on human consumption you get infected. Now the question was with that virus can we show that there is any possible zoonotic interaction that the virus might also be possible infecting humans. So how can you do that? The most straightforward way would be to do serology in the human population in the area whether there is any immune response to that virus which would tell you that there is some transmission which would be the first stage for a possible pathogenic or causal pathogen relationship. So that then raised the point we have to be able rapidly to build serologic assays for basically any virus that we detect with which we can do sero surveys in the human population and by that distinguish non-relevant from potential pathogenic viruses. And that concept then uh, grew into again a larger program. This here is showing the EcoHealth work. Here the people did use metadata to identify regions in the world where new emerging diseases are likely to originate or to occur based on um, population density, uh, density of livestock or wild animals, uh, economic, ecologic conditions and so on. And so the point would be to go in these regions, try to identify the agents before they become a real threat to the human population, 
which would also imply field work and mobile laboratories. So the plan was to screen the most likely um, animals that have human interaction and possibility to transmit agents, screen them blindly for possible agent and then characterize whether these agents might, um, might become uh, the next pandemic agent. So the program has the mission to detect agents that have not yet emerged. How do you do that? That was one of the challenges. And um, to make the point why to do that, um, this shows uh, worldwide air traffic, so people move at a rapid scale, a scale improving scale, so um, the spread very rapidly and more frequently through the whole um, Earth and globe, and so you want to go preventively out to the source and try to stop the disease before it really becomes an epidemic or a real threat. In addition, livestock, there is also a certain amount of livestock trade and travel movement. That's another risk factor. And um, this is an example where we used our mobile detection capacity in 2014, 13, uh, 14, MERS coronavirus, the next um, uh, human coronavirus was characterized and detected in Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula. And again, we were asked by the Ministry of Health and Agriculture there to um, come in and do some work. In several missions, uh, first missions, we identified virus in bats. As I told you, um, bats are considered a major reservoir for coronaviruses. So the first idea was maybe bats are the reservoir also for MERS coronavirus. We did find a single sequence in a single uh, bat in Saudi Arabia um, that was a uh, success, uh, success, but it was not the most likely reservoir for the human disease that was observed. And then when our Dutch colleagues identified seropositivity against MERS coronavirus in camels, in that case um, in Africa and um, um, Spanish islands in, uh, near Africa. Um, then we thought that um, we should also do a survey in Saudi Arabian camels and characterize the presence of um, MERS there. This shows the single positive bat um, sequence that was obtained by PCR for MERS coronavirus in Egyptian tomb bat. But um, again, we then moved with the mobile equipment for serology to uh, Saudi Arabia and did a survey of uh, camels throughout the country, so from the north and around the country, and uh, found very high seroprevalence, uh, 90, up to 90% in juvenile camels. So that was uh, very intriguing. And then with molecular equipment, we also showed presence of nucleic acid in nasal swap swaps. And um, upon sequencing, the sequences of the camel-derived uh, material was basically identical to the human virus. So it was the same virus in the camels as in the humans. And the virus from the nasal swaps was alive, so pathogenic. It was growing in culture. It was not just nucleic acid, but it was live virus that was shed. So those all raised, um, raised uh, the importance of camels as a reservoir and the most likely uh, source of the human infections, uh, considering the density of camels in Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula and also the close interaction of people with camels or with camel products and that's ongoing work to characterize the actual mechanisms how the virus might get from uh, camel to human and then uh, develop countermeasures to prevent that. Now how frequent is that? We mentioned SARS and MERS as truly new viruses. This is an older um, slide from Anthony Fauci where he summarized the um, emerging diseases of the past decade uh, that was a decade ago. 
and then some recent ones you might remember the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, um, MERS in Saudi Arabia, there are several that were added recently. So it happens and it seemed to happen on a relative constant increasing scale that uh, new agents um, appear and have to be uh, characterized. Now on a general concept you might also follow what Steve Moss and Peter Dajak called the zoonotic pool. The idea here is if you assume that every of the 50,000 vertebrate uh, species has just a few viruses that are endemic in them, then you get to a real high number of viruses and compared to the 2,000 virus species, species that are currently characterized, it tells you that the vast majority of viruses still have to be discovered and uh, provide a large potential pool for emerging zoonotic agents. But not just that, also if you think about regular laboratory di diagnosis, this is data from the United States, so but in general about 60% of encephalitis cases, active um, disease uh, in hospitalized patients remains without in diagnosis similar acute respiratory disease, there is a large percentage of not um, characterized samples or in enteric disease, it's not much different. That might have reasons in um, sample issues, you know, transport storage, that there is no um, virus detectable anymore. Uh, it might also have uh, issues with um, poor performance of assays, uh, but it also raises the opportunity that there are other agents involved than the ones that are currently on diagnostic um, test batteries. So in classical diagnosis you have one test for one agent and you test for one or two or three agents, but that's a very limited um, breadth of detection. And so one example that uh, brings that story home very nicely, I think, was in 2005, 6, nope, oops, yeah, in 2005, 6, um, at that point, we had developed a large multiplex PCR assay, an assay which, which you can detect 20 or 30 agents in one single uh, assay. So if you think about respiratory disease, what comes to mind? Influenza, respiratory disease, um, or syncytial disease virus, rhinovirus, so you, and then bacteria, um, streptococcus, pneumonia, haemophilus. So you end up with about 20, 30 agents that are usually responsible for um, respiratory disease. At that point, um, 2005, 4, 5 in the season, the New York State Department of Health uh, recorded a higher percentage of samples that remained negative in um, testing for um, influenza-like uh, illness in patients, so they do test routinely for influenza-like illness in uh, samples submitted by practitioners. Uh, in that year, there was a large percentage that remained negative for influenza. The question was, what can be an agent that circulates and causes influenza-like illness? And with that assay, they asked us to test for all the bacteria and viruses. We found quite a bit in those samples, or um, uh, often mul multiple infection of several bacteria or viruses or mixtures thereof. But one of the surprises was when we tested um, the samples more um, detailed, we found a new virus. So what um, did we do in that assay? The multiplex PCR uses primers that carry uh, small molecular tags attached to them that can be cleaved by UV light, a photocleavable linkage. So what you do is you have a primer pair for agent A, a primer pair for agent B, 
primer pair for A, G, and C, and each of the primers is labeled with a different tag. You prepare regular PCR, separate the products from unincorporated primers on a filter plate, then split the tags by UV light and inject it through a mass spectrometer, and then you measure the tags, the molecular weights of them you know. So you ask, is A or B present, or B or C present, and it tells you which virus was in the sample, or which combination of viruses or agents was in the sample. So you can detect 30 agents uh, in one run. What we found was a lot of rhinovirus infection, but when you sequence them, they didn't match the at that point in time known rhinovirus species A or B, they were a new clade, which was rhinovirus 3, a C, the third um, clade of rhinovirus, species of rhinovirus. So that was kind of surprising. If you recall rhinovirus, or in that case, uh, picornaviruses, enteroviruses, were one of the first viruses characterized in 1956. And so it was an object of study for almost um, 60, 80 years, and a whole species of viruses was missed. Why did that happen? The classical diagnostic for rhinovirus or enteroviruses is culture. And these guys don't grow in culture. Even to that day, there is no accepted culture system to isolate rhinovirus C. And so when we went back into repositories with PCR for rhinovirus C, we found them. The people characterized them and at non-identified or characterized enteroviruses. They are in pr pretty much every um, diagnostic laboratory. And so the virus is not truly new. Estimated time to the most common ancestor, so the most common uh, ancestor of that clade, is about the same as for the other clades, so it circulates probably for the same time as rhinovirus A and B. But it was not detected, not characterized. So that then led to a kind of new concept, uh, syndromic surveillance or diagnostic, that you use assays that characterize really the agents that might be responsible for the syndrome. So all the agents for respiratory disease or all the viruses for enteric disease or for encephalitis or you name it. And with those multiplex uh, molecular assays, you have the tools to do so. And what you see in many cases, also in India probably, you have surveillance for an agent that is, a, that is a real culprit, but you detect usually a small percentage of sample positive for yellow fever here in Africa. 99% of the etiology is the submerged uh, tip or underneath the tip of the iceberg submerged. So within syndromic um, paradigm, you get insight in those um, conditions. Now, we built multiplex PCR assays, also array assays, that allow you to do quite uh, comprehensive diagnostics. But all of that for us was focused on human or vertebrate uh, agents, potential zoonotic agent, agents, and as life plays. We then got involved or asked by people to look into a disease in bees, colony collapse disorder. So there was a large, uh, 2006, 5, 6, large um, outbreak or uh, decline in bee populations. The bees were just dying. Nobody had an idea why or how that happens. Colony collapse disorder was uh, threatening the bee populations and the bee industry, it's a whole industry in uh, the United States where bees are carried around the country from the almond bloom in California to the orange bloom in Florida. And if you think about it, it's you know, a system poised for disaster if you have a large monoculture that is under poor conditions, you know, circulated through the area, it will just uh, end up with an disease and spread of disease. Anyway, Bees are quite important as pollinators of major um, animal food crops. And so though we were in a department of public health, it was something that we tried to tackle. But how, as I told you, the essays were geared towards vertebrate viruses, so how to do a deal with these likely insect um, agents. The only method available 
sequencing. So at that time, Ian was consulting with uh, 454, a company that was working on high throughput uh, sequencing systems. And one Friday evening, when they were down for a visit, we jokingly were talking about, hey, if you would sequence everything in the sample that is delivered, and then subtract those background, in that case human, human genome was just sequenced and available, what's left over should be the pathogen. And that we remembered when we were confronted with the B problem and then actually did the experiment. So we sequenced everything in the sample from these bees. We could identify um, a number of viruses and also bacteria. The sample material was whole bees, so there was the gut bacteria and everything the bees carried. But among them, there were some viruses, one of them Israel acute paralysis virus, which was highly linked to uh, the colony collapse co disorder condition. So there was a statistical um, relationship and a high risk ratio for those viruses, and that then triggered subsequent investigation into um, that condition. And it turns out it's probably multiple viruses and other conditions that contribute to colony collapse disorder. But anyway, the uh, method, high throughput sequencing, turned out to be a very efficient way to characterize new um, pathogens because it's completely unbiased. You have to know nothing about the agent you are hunting. The only condition is it has to have a DNA, so we cannot do prion diseases, but everything else we can do. Just some example here, we characterized in collaboration with um, our South African colleagues in acute hemorrhagic fever uh, disease that occurred in um, South Africa and um, characterized a virus, Lujo virus, that is the first human pathogenic arena virus since Lassa virus that was identified and it was the first one in the southern part of the continent. All the others are up in the central or western region. Anyway, there is not um, that much time to go into detail. Another virus was a new raptor virus, Musa virus, that we uh, identified in collaboration with colleagues in Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. Here the interesting point was we got sequence for almost all of the genome of that raptor virus, but two open reading frames or region that is occupied in other raptor virus by two open reading frames was spared. These are usually the phosphoprotein and the glycoprotein. And um, so uh, the, the phosphoprotein and the matrix protein. So the question was why did that happen? We have everything else. The genome is a continuous unit, so the sequence must be in the sample, but we cannot detect it. And um, we could prove that with PCR, if we do a primer here and a primer here, we could cross that region, we found the sequence. The point was, molecular diagnostics is only as good as the database it resides on. And databases currently are still pretty poor. If you look at gene bank and the distribution, that's an older slide that changed a little bit, but still the distribution. The vast ma majority of sequences are retrovirus, flavivirus, automyxovirus, influenza, okay, HIV, and then hip, um, hepatoviruses, uh, flavivirus being hepatitis C. So those are the sequences. And the 59 other viral families, they are vastly underrepresented and you barely have sequence. Even worse, if you look at the size distribution, most of the information is only available as short PCR lengths, fragments, and longer sequence or whole genomes is a minority. So that is very poor material for these molecular analysis and high throughput um, sequence analysis. That was then a point to improve databases, so we started programs to look into repositories for isolated agents and uh, sequence them to put sequence in the database. That's a project here Rashmi was um, leading where we did analyze um, Banya viruses, a whole class or um, serogroup of um, 
Spanya viruses, the Viomia group, sequenced all the isolates and uh, did that for the whole genome. Banya viruses come with a tri-segmented genome, three genome fragments. Um, there is quite a bit of information for the small segment, less for the M segment, and basically nothing for the L segments. So if you think about a reassortment of segments that play a role in pathogenicity, evolution um, of Banya viruses, uh, you lack all the information from the L segment and so we started whole genome sequences, sequencing of the viruses. Another project where Rajmi was involved was then uh, Upulu and Aransas Bay. They are characterized as non-grouped Banya viruses, but when we sequenced them, they turned out to be orthomyxoviruses, in fact. So, s some of the information that you find in textbooks is far from correct and right. Now, with the sequencing, if you looked into that, there are many platforms available. They are also rapidly evolving, so what we started out with uh, a couple of years ago doesn't exist anymore, and there are new ones coming up um, every month or six months. They have str uh, different strengths and features. Some of them work very rapid if you think about um, patient diagnostic or outbreak situations, that's something that makes more sense. Others can handle tremendous volumes of sequence, but they take too long uh, for diagnostic purposes, uh, but they are good for surveillance projects and then there are intermediate things. Meanwhile, also sequencing platforms that you can use on the road or in the field, so that will be also a very interesting area. And we might return to these discussions in more detail in the workshop where we can um, drill deeper on some of those um, um, platforms. Now, all of them suffer basically from a basic problem. If you sequence a piece of liver for hepatitis virus, you find 99.9999% human sequence and you might find a very small percentage of viral sequence. So how can we improve on that? Um, there are various ways to purify and enrich um, the viral material, but they are usually quite cumbersome, long-lasting and contamination prone. So we were looking for a different approach and now settled for capture assay, basically similar to exome capture. So that was um, a method published um, not too long ago. It became then one of the world changing ideas uh, that was adopted by uh, Scientific American. And meanwhile, it's also licensed by Roche and uh, BioReliance as a commercial product. What did we do? We basically used our databases, all the viral information, coding domain information um, for vertebrate viruses in the databases, then weeded out um, those um, that are not characterized oops, taxonomically um, and made small oligonucleotide probes for all those sequences, two million of them, and used them as a capture to bring down um, the target sequences. So here again we synthesized those oligonucleotide with a biotin uh, marker on a race. Uh, not we do, it's a commercial product by Roche, Nimblegen, and those two million um, oligos are then used in a classical um, high throughput pathway so you get sample material, extract nucleic acid, shear it, put on adapters, then you use those fragments to capture only the ones of viral origin, wash away the background, and then amplify and sequence. So it works on any platform um, and is just inserted in the LIBOR preparation uh, procedure. What can you achieve with it? With viral capture, we improve our viral read by a um, 100 to a 1,000 fold in complex samples, blood or lung, and even more so in less complex saliva, spinal fluid, urine samples. So it's highly efficient, effective to uh, enrich for viral sequences. And um, sensitivity increases a lot. 
and here we did compare real-time PCR to the capture sequencing, so basically with two molecules measured by real-time PCR in the starting material, we get full genome sequence up and capture and sequencing, and the same not only in serum but in blood with a slightly higher um, concentration of, of virus, but still four molecules by real-time PCR and 70% genome sequence. Um, I'm running a little late, so let's skip that. So the benefits are increased sequencing depth, sensitivity, um, replacement of all other cumbersome and uh, in some cases not very beneficial enrichment strategies. We enrich for all vertebrate targets and also detect related or new viruses as long as they are 40% similar to the information available in the databases. And as I told you, there is work ongoing to improve, increase the information in the databases, so that will improve further. And it's highly economic. You can multiplex the samples on some of these big sequencing machines, so the per sample costs are going down very rapidly, and it's now used with a lot of collaborators all over the globe, in part due to, due to the commercialization of the product. Then next we built the same for bacterial capture. Here we focus mainly on antibiotic resistance, pathogenicity markers, so you don't want to know that you have coli in the gut, it's always there, but you have to know whether it's enterotoxin producing, shiga toxin producing, or whether it has resistance to the antibiotic you are using, using to treat the patient. So that now is in place and again gives a huge improvement and now we work on a capture system for eukaryotic pathogens, so fungi, uh, parasites, microparasites that will come up uh, shortly. Now with all that mythology we can detect any agent, any virus, but is it relevant? If you find it, it doesn't mean it's the cause of the disease. Classically, you would implicate a pathogen in disease through cross postulates, right? You have to find in every case of the disease, you have, it has to be specific for that uh, disease and only for that disease. You isolate it in culture and you apply it to an animal or model system and recreate the disease. Now, we all know that doesn't work in many cases. What can you do? So, there might be no um, culture system, there might be no model system, there might be many other cases that go south. So based on our work, Ian uh, recently formulated an alternative um, likelihood level so you can define a possible relationship, a probable relationship and then go to the full confirmation. What we are aiming at one of the easy early um, conditions or predictors would be in um, adaptive immune response. So if we find an agent and can show an adaptive immune response, that's a good candidate uh, to pursue further and we can uh, drop the ones that don't um, have that feature. So that is now a new arm of the project to go to next generation sequencing. If you think about ELISA system, Western blood, what have you, it's usually one single plex assays and they are not on par what we can do with high throughput sequencing. But we still can use the same technology from NimbleGen and now build peptides, oligopeptides, and can do that in high density up to three million oops, peptides on an array. And again, we use the database to extract all the coding sequencing, translate it into amino acids, split it down in small peptides, put them on the array and ask, is there an antibody that reacts to this or that or whatever virus? And we do that with overlapping peptides. So we have 12 mass that are shifted by one amino acid. And so a true antibody binding gives you a series of overlapping peptides where the common sequence is the epitope recognized by the antibody. And the single peptide signals is background and artificial uh, reaction. And with that system we can very easily identify or characterize epitopes. And that came 
in very handy recently when there was the Zika outbreak in South America. Zika virus, as you know, is again a flavivirus very closely related to dengue virus, chikungunya virus, and um, um, West Nile virus. No, chikungunya virus is not um, a flavivirus, but anyway, also circulating in the area. So here the question was, how can we distinguish Zika virus from the dengue viruses, the four dengue viruses, which are highly cross-reactive, even on the sequence level, most of the peptides are identical and there are only a few percent that are potentially differentiating. Even in um, virus neutralization assays, you frequently get cross-reactivity. So what we used here was the peptide array to screen Zira from dengue patients and Zika patients and identify epitopes that are unique, reactive with Zika or dengue virus and could identify those epitopes, make peptide ELISAs with it and now have a cheap high throughput ELISA that can distinguish um, Zika and dengue virus. In fact, we also included um, peptides for chikungunya virus and West Nile virus to distinguish all those viruses that are circulating in the area. And again, built also in PCR assay, five-plex assay, a five-plex real-time PCR assay that is specific for all those agents and that just got emergency use authorization by the USDA in the US so that will become available very shortly. Um, we also used the zero chip to characterize tick-borne disease, which is quite um, important, especially in the northeastern US where you have um, um, no, Lyme disease circulating. So here we focus on bacterial agents um, distinguishing the um, tick-borne bacteria that can um, confound uh, Lyme disease or interfere with Lyme disease. So that um, is also um, upcoming, it's up for pub publication um, shortly, the papers are submitted. Now I want to end in the last, last five minutes maybe with a project that we do here in India. So about a month ago, a little more, um, Ian was contacted by the National Institute of Virology and Indian Council of Medical Research in respect to that ongoing um, acute encephalitis syndrome in Gorampur and um, he and Nishay went there a um, month ago to extract samples and begin uh, analysis so we are using the viral capture system to look for viral agents in those samples and at the moment it appears that there is not a single agent uh, responsible so on, but um, a cap, um, mixture or multitude of agents that um, are involved or not in the condition. I mean some are classical encephalitis agents, others are not. Again the question will be is there um, presence um, in the spinal fluid or can we show immune response. Also looking into uh, bacterial agents with the bacterial capture uh, system, we found the agent causing scrub typhus orienta uh, saramucci and also other bacteria. Again, the question is um, who is relevant and who are the uh, agents to blame. So that's work that just started uh, on a larger scale. And so with respect to the initial points, where did we get in the past 20 or 25 years? We can do now highly parallel testing, multiplex testing for basically any agent. There is no bias in testing. In the, let's say, old days, you started with one agent and maybe the next agent then ran out of sample or of money or of time. Here we can do it all parallel, every sample is tested against every agent and so you really can address multifactorial diseases where you have multiple agents involved and also define the interplay of agents so especially viral and bacteria have a close relationship 
in the uh, rhinovirus model, for example, you can show in vitro that infection with rhinovirus upregulates certain surface proteins that are used by streptococci as uh, receptors, so you get increased infection by streptococcal up on uh, rhinovirus infection, and these processes also happen in vivo, and these offers um, ways to analyze and address those questions. Real-time data, so we can do many of the assays on a very rapid time scale, hours or days, that will still increase and improve in the coming uh, years. Um, the other aspect is with um, many of the machines now connected to the internet, you get very rapid data analysis that can be shared and spread on a local level, on a national level, international level. So the information and outbreak situation or endemic situation can be generated very rapidly and spread also very rapidly um, between all um, uh, stakeholders. In part, we saw that already in the um, Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa, I mean, exclude the early difficulties until the response really got into gear. But once the systems were established there, PCR and sequencing um, um, platforms, there was a very rapid grow of data and a very rapid exchange. Everything was posted online, was available to basically anybody. You could live look at the data as they were generated. And then discovery, yes, we can detect basically everything that is out there. Um, what is the problem is how to make a call for a causal relationship that's still time consuming and a little cumbersome. As I told you, we work on serologic approaches to maybe improve that to get a quicker idea what might be relevant agent and then focus on them to characterize them further. And also I showed you examples um, that in many cases the new virus doesn't have to be really new. It might be a known culprit that occurs in a new context or in an unexpected uh, situation. And with that, I want to close not without um, thanking all the people in the center that are involved in it, several you saw in the slides we've connected with the projects. So the main persons to mention here in the diagnostic platforms are uh, Rafael Tukas, who is focusing on the TIC um, project, uh, Nishay Mishra, who works on the PCR and peptide assay uh, approaches. Um, that's, I think, the main ones to mention here. And uh, I will not close without mentioning all the collaborators, nationally and internationally. Without their contribution, none of this work would have been possible, and it's always the source of all the work to get the right samples, well-characterized samples, to have the people on the ground that collect the samples and call you in when there is something new or unusual happening. That's the foundation on which we built. And with that, I want to thank you for the attention. And Hello? Yes, yeah, so we have time for some questions. So thank you, uh, Professor Thomas, uh, for the wonderful uh, tour uh, of your research uh, from a global perspective uh, on the emerging and 
re-emerging um, zoonotic diseases especially. Uh, it was, though I'm not trained as a, a virologist, but there was a lot of learning, especially uh, uh, the amount of technology development that you talked about. Uh, having done differential display and knowing uh, the amount of false positive that you get into, and then, uh, you know, the dialogue that you had uh, with Dr. Ian Lipkin regarding the 454 sequencing and the power that it promises. And of course, the zero chip is absolutely wonderful. I mean, uh, the precise power of rapid diagnostics, parallel testing, field surveillance is something very powerful. I'm sure um, our uh, audience uh, from the Indian front especially would want to uh, probably ask and know about uh, you know uh, these aspects that they can do uh, for them for capacity building, especially in the serology testing, like the rhinoviruses that you talked about, which are not possible to be cultured, and how you discover it eventually after a period of time is something probably that would be interesting. Uh, as well. And just to add on, I was fortunate to have attended uh, Professor uh, Harold Rossen's Nobel lecture um, when he was awarded uh, the a Nobel Prize for HPV and also had an active collaboration with Professor Mulerker for years. And he particularly talked about a kind of drifting away, apart from his work on HPV, that right now uh, the major concern is for uh, the zoonotic uh, diseases, especially because of uh, the intermingling of uh, the uh, animal uh, reservoir with that of the humans. And so there has to be a rapid need uh, for better detection strategies. So which you already have taken a wonderful initiative with Ian Lipkin uh, in the uh, encephalitis, uh, acute encephalitis, which really plagues uh, in the uh, Indian scenario. So uh, this is open for uh, forum for, uh, for on the uh, front for the various medical colleges as well. If anyone has any question uh, from any of the audience uh, who is uh, connected via the surveillance system, as well as in the audience here, uh, Himanshu and Professor Prabha and a whole lot of people, Dr. Tool, if you want to have comments or queries, clarifications, prospects for collaboration, etc. So, uh, like we have to come to you or it's commercially available? Maybe repeat this. Can you repeat this? Can you repeat this? Uh, your word platform, VERT, virus capture, that is available commercially or we have to come to you to for the investigations uh, using that platform? As I mentioned, the uh, virus capture platform is now available commercially. So it was licensed to Roche, and as far as I know, Roche has released it. It's now available. I don't know the catalog number, but but I heard okay, it is out. And uh, BioReliance also licensed it, and probably will bring it on the market during this year. Okay. And what about the other platforms, like the protocols, uh, the intricate protocols? If you want to imitate or if you want to use these platforms at our uh, end. Uh, simply going through the, like, it will need an elaborate protocol at our end. So this can be shared? Yeah, as I say, for the uh, viral capture, the protocols are available with the product through Rush. And for the other, I don't know which platform you refer to, you can always get those through us or in collaboration with us. Okay. And uh, like, uh, Dr. Gorakhpur uh, investigation, what's your, like, uh, future uh, course of investigation? Well, I mean, as I said, it just started a month ago or so, a little more, and we did the first analysis with about 80 sam samples um, to get an overview. And um, as I told you, it doesn't look like a single agent is the main culprit. So from that, we need more sample and a larger study, which started now and is in progress. Um, so we want to basically inventory, analyze what viruses, what bacteria are present and how is the correlation to disease. So we have uh, pretty well characterized groups of um, fatal um, acute encephalitis syndrome, of um, milder 
uh, symptomatic or uh, some healthy controls so that we can hopefully figure out what are the most likely agents related to the condition and then go deeper probably with serology and find out uh, what are the main drivers of the disease. Yeah, actually two years back CDC also had investigation there, like they collected the samples, they did high throughput sequencing, but the issue is like, uh, is the cause infectious? That's the first thing uh, we have to be sure. Right, I, you know, mentioned that and um, yeah, gave some ideas how to maybe get to a, into a better position with serology that we get uh, at least the first indicator what our agents to focus on and then it will go down to uh, laboratory in vitro assays and actually uh, see, you know, is it pathogenic and what's the mechanism of pathogenicity for the particular agent. That's still in cumbersome and quite, you know, time consuming process. And um, sure, we think about potential solutions and how to develop um, methods to improve on that, but that will probably be work of the next decade to, to get there um, really further. But I think it's impressive how far one yeah. got already, and now the next hurdle is there, and after that there will be the next one, right? So yeah. it always continues. Um, but again, at least in the case of the acute uh, encephalitis syndrome, there seemed to be not a truly new or exotic agent involved. It seemed to be pretty well-known agents. So for some of them, we do know whether they are pathogenic and what uh, condition or what mechanism do they work. And even if these are mutants or any variants, you have a guide on you know, how to work and how to address the system. So I think you can get quite far with that approach in a relatively short time. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for a nice talk. So you are, uh, I, it's, a, it's a very big and massive work you are doing. So you are cataloging almost, uh, or trying to cataloging all pathogens or virus and bacteria. So are you have uh, any, uh, I mean, uh, um, or any possibility to catalog the signature response? You have said that adaptive immune response are the, uh, one can capture and then find out the disease. So do you have any, uh, any just uh, comment or suggestions for cataloging the signatures associated with those pathogens, the molecular signatures? Yeah, that's a very good question. I didn't have time to really allude on that aspect. Yes, we do work in that direction. Uh, for example, there's one project um, that we do with David Wellman um, where, I mean, there have, has been long hypothesis that you might be able to detect infection and even differentiate viral, bacterial, or other infection through the host response. May it be a cytokine um, type of responses, innate immune responses, um, other changes in the metabolism of the host um, metabolomics that you can characterize through those responses what was the infection or the trigger. Um, that's one aspect that we try to link the work on the infectious agent with the host response and either get to predictive or confirmatory information out of the host response. As it turns out, um, for the moment, the host response seems to be not very specific in terms to identify the agent. As I said, you might be able to distinguish bacterial and viral infection or some uh, sub divisions of that, but it will probably not go much more specific. But anyway, it could be a great help and a great source of information. The other problem is if you think about metabolomics or some of the others, it might take quite a while. They are not really rapid yet. So that's work that is also ongoing to maybe make them more efficient and, and a little quicker and more usable for the purpose. Um, 
So that's uh, one area. Then we do uh, do cytokine, uh, lymphokine uh, panels and um, uh, profiles for the patients and try to make links what pattern fits to what infection. So that I think also is growing but will request, require a lot of empirical data to catalog how do those uh, things work that is not a priori interpretable or predictable um, how those uh, information indicate the disease or can predict uh, what, what is going on. But anyway, yes, that are certainly areas that fit into the serology and uh, identification of pathogens and pathogenicity um, picture. Um, the other thing that is probably available but not very straightforward is with the sequencing. If you currently, I told you, we do sequence everything in the sample, subtract the host, in that case human sequence, and then look uh, at what's left. But if you would look at the human portion, you could also see you know, changes in transcript profile or upregulation of this and that. Part of the information is available through uh, array characterization, so what would likely go up and what does it indicate. But there the problem is um, privacy. So on one hand, we are either not allowed to look at the human portion or it would require certain regulatory changes to do so. Somatical issues. Um, so I think people look at it occasionally, but it's not officially, you know, permissible for ethical privacy, um, what have you, um, data protection reasons. Um, so then it depends again on, on this, how the study is structured. If you have anonymous data, okay, it's one thing. If you have patient information or identifiers, it's a different story. Then it depends on where it's done, what country, under what regulatory purposes. But in general, you could think about that also as a source to get, uh, I think, important information uh, that one could mine and explore. As I said, it might be done in some small scale, but it's not really part of the... So I think you, you are suggesting that it is a long way to make this kind of signature for infections. Um, yeah, I think it's a longer way. Longer way, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was actually very intrigued by the uh, platform where you said that we would be able to identify all existing viruses in a sample of human blood. Now we're looking in effect at changing ecosystems of uh, viruses with a lot of viruses changing their uh, host patterns and causing uh, new zoonotic diseases as well. Uh, in the context of these changing ecosystems and given that you would be able to identify existing viruses in a human sample, which need not necessarily be pathogens, they could just be a virus existing there, would it be possible to predict um, host susceptibility to the prevalent potentially zoonotic viruses? Would that be possible? Um, I mean, that's basically also part of the predict pro project that I mentioned where we try to catalog, uh, to catalog all the viruses in different species and the question is what's the likelihood of species jump in that case to the human and can you find any patterns that would allow you to predict this virus is more likely to jump than another one. And um, we, in that case, Simon Anthony um, of EcoHealth um, that is working on the PREDICT samples um, just did some study where we tried to address that. And the baseline outcome, it was a study with macaque uh, groups that have interaction with human or not, and we were tracing the viruses uh, through the macaque populations and the human populations. And um, the short answer is there are some patterns that seem to be um, predictable, that have rules they follow through. 
but there are other factors that seem to be stochastic and, and driven by chance. So I think um, it may not be possible to reliably predict, but we may be able to define some factors that increase the risk or the likelihood. Host factors, you mean? Uh, factors, no, um, features of the virus or the system that promote or support a species jump. Seems not. Hello. Hey. Uh, uh, Thomas, I wanted to ask you one great question. Is that how do you enter any endemic area? Uh, what is the procedure and what are the steps to enter into that unknown area for any viral investigations? What are the steps you follow? Uh, suppose a Gorakhpur area, we do not know what is a virus, what is an organism. It is an unknown area. We, we go in the raw mind, what type of organism and how you start your doing investigation, what is first, what is second, what is third, and what is fourth, and how do you conclude later? That with all evidence, with all serum, sequencing, how do you uh, come to the conclusion that this particular organism would be uh, responsible for this idea? Because it cannot be multiple. Any outbreak has to have a single organism. But what is the steps of doing work in that area? Yeah, I mean, as you already, I would say, touched on, it, it's different, I think, from each outbreak or each situation. Uh, um, what, what are the details there? Um, I mean, one example would be the MERS experience, you know, um, where for various reasons, the, the most efficient way was to go in with mobile equipment and do it at the, at the source of uh, the studies. In that case, from the information that was available, uh, it was clear that we need serology because that was the only information available from the Dutch studies that there is uh, seroprevalence. So um, that was the first step. Then we wanted to look for presence of actual virus, so PCR was the logical next step, given that culture was only possible under certain regulatory procedures, PSL3 environment and so on. And um, then characterize the agent, and what's ongoing now is um, trying to figure out the, the ways or, or um, interaction between the reservoir camel and human, how that does the um, transmission actually work. And in that case, what, what's particular puzzling is you have that huge, as it appears, reservoir with a very high load or, or um, circulation of the agent, and compared to that, you have relatively few human cases. So usually you would expect way more um, human infection. And so I'm not perfectly sure what you mean with, with different steps. I mean, in basically all studies, we depend largely on the local party, what is their capacity, interest, and, and procedure or strategy. So they usually tell us what they want and what they can do, and then we try to figure out how to best address the question with the means that are available. And if you look into the Gurampur um, case, yeah, there it was, you know, samples were available. Um, nothing was really identified. And the question was, can we use the viral or the bacterial uh, screen to get some more insight? And based on the data, you then design the next step. Yeah. No, but I wanted to say, that suppose Gorakhpur once upon a time, JE was in circulation. Yeah. The moment we did a vaccination in 2006, JE virus has disappeared. You do not get JE virus, frankly, because very short viremia, as you told, very. But at the same time, we do not get a serological assay also. In this situation, if I enter into the Gorakhpur, neither I'll get a clue for JE, neither are, nor I'll get clue for other viruses. Because once you do, do the immunization, these antibodies, they will neutralize the viruses. At the same time, you do not get a very good IgM response too. 
So how do you go in this area? I am talking about that situation. Where the virus is not available, antibodies are not also available. How do you get a clue that what virus would be circulating? But epidemic is remain over there. Yeah, but I mean, I think what you have to do is do larger studies, do appropriate epidemiology and surveillance, and probably it takes, also there might be seasonality and everything involved, so it takes a longer time frame to get an overview of what, what is but, going but, on. But in, in SARS coronaviruses, you had antibody response, you went to the camel, because it didn't do, you didn't do the vaccination in that area. You, get, you could get the viruses, you could get the antibodies, and you could match the things finally. But here you have done the vaccination. Right, you're you, perfectly you are, right there. It was a very simple system here. It's a yeah. very more complicated In this system situation, with many how do you players. Go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. More questions? Seems not to be the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, may I request uh, uh, Dr. Rashmi to please present a memento uh, to Professor Thomas for 